By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back with X points right here on Timmy Talks. We are going to look at the finals number 20, which is quite exciting. It's between Joe and Lucas. Now, both of these players are playing with Lantex heavy strategies. So it's going to be a really exciting and interesting matchup. We have Joe who's on white, red, uh, Lantex, Lance, Edge strategy. And he's taking on Lucas uh, Glavin. And he's playing with a Dark Heart of the Woods, Lantex. So it's a white and green strategy. Well, and black, of course, for those Dark Heart of the Wood. And I believe there's also one Darylor in here, which is pretty cool. I like that. I like that inclusion of the one Darylor. Now, before I go into these decks, because I've got beautiful deck photos of both of these decks, I would first just like to very briefly explain what X Points is about in case you don't know what that for format is so here you can see their point system so x points follows the rules of atlantic that means that we are playing with fallen empires in this one and uh, on top of that they also have their own point system so in total you can spend 10 points on cards with points on them for example if you choose to play in this case a land text in your deck that's two points for each land text that you play so if you play with four land text you've already spent eight points and it's going to be impossible to also play a balance then in that same deck or a soul ring so you have to really kind of puzzle to find out you know what kind of points allocation works best for your deck the aim of the point system is to create a diverse um, you know, a diverse card pool and that you can see a lot of different decks. So it's going to be harder to just say, okay, I'm just going to put the full power nine in because, hey, they're the nine best cards in the game. So I'm just going to play them regardless. That's not possible in a format like this. Now, before I start with the deck tech, um, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to go first to the match. I know some of you enjoy doing that. The easiest way to do so is checking the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG games. Click on there. That will take you straight to the games. And here I'm going to start with the deck. Uh, the decks, I should say, because we've got two of them. And I'm going to start with the uh, the red and the white deck, the deck of Joe. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Joe, Tax Edge. Now, this deck really revolves around two cards, Lantex and Lance Edge. So maybe start with Lantex because Lantex is going to be a key card for both of these players. So that's going to be pretty funny. Both players kind of waiting when they can activate their tax. But um, Lantex and the enchantment for one white from Legends. And it reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards, reveal them and put them into your hand and then shuffle. So this is great, right? Because you're filtering out the lands of your deck, meaning that you're probably not going to find any basic lands from the top of your library or you have, you know, a smaller chance to do so. So you're going to find your other cards. And of course, you always have enough lands to play out. But on top of that, of course, there are all sorts of strategies with this card. Like, what are you going to do with all those lands? Now, one of those strategies includes this card, Lance Edge. Two red and one to cast for an enchant world from Legends that read, discard a card. If the discarded card was a land card, Lance Edge deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. Any player may activate this ability. So, first of all, how cool is it that you can just discard a card with this? You can just discard a card. It doesn't have to be a land card. But anyway, if it's a land card, you can deal two damage to target player. Um, and your opponent can do this as well. So this Lance Edge strategy against another land text deck can be very risky, especially since, of course, the opponent of Joe has Dark Heart of the Wood to gain some life from those lands. Now, um, he has this engine going, and the Lantex Lance Edge strategy is probably just to finish the opponent off because he's playing with four Lightning Bolts, four Chain Lightnings, uh, four Black Vices and four Ankh of Mishra. So he's got a lot of ways to play very aggressively, deal a lot of damage. On top of that, his creature base is very aggressive as well, right? We see four Savannah Lines, uh, four Javelineers and two White Knights and two Mishra's Factories. So I think if you're Joe, you just want this game to, to, uh, to be done with very, very quickly. You're going to deal a lot of early damage with your with your bolts, with your vices, with cards like that, and then you're going to finish it off with your land tax lance edge strategy. And because you're putting pressure on your opponent, you're forcing your opponent to play out lands and play out things, right? Because you simply don't want to die. I think black vice and land tax is a really nice. Uh, card synergy because a black vice is forcing your opponent to kind of empty his hand right how can you empty your hand you got to play your lance right because you want to play out your spells so if you play out your lance you're activating the land text of joe here so i think it's really nice 
uh, synergy. Of course, the problem is uh, what I what I discussed earlier is that his opponent is also playing a land tech strategy and has Dark Heart of the Wood. Dark Heart of the Wood is going to be a problem for Joe or could become a problem for Joe. I think it's up to Joe to just go so quickly that um, you don't even get into that mid section of the game. If that's going to happen, we'll just have to wait and see. This is the deck of Joe and now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent. And here we see the deck of Lucas Dark Taxes. Now Dark Taxes, again, a Lantex based deck, right? Lantex is super important in this deck. But uh, the cool thing here is that we can see two different strategies, right? Where uh, Joe is going to go for the Lands Edge. Uh, we see Lucas going for a different strategy. He's playing with a card called the Dark Heart of the Wood, a card that we've seen more and more lately. It's an enchantment from the dark, one green and uh, one black to cast. And it reads, sacrifice the f uh, a forest, you gain three life. So if you have an active land tax, you can use that land tax to find basic forests. You can feed those forests to the dark heart of the wood. And of course, this works both ways. So, and you gain life, but also you make sure that you always have less lands than your opponents so that you can keep your land tax activated. So it's super cool. And when you're in a race, like against that white and red deck, which is very aggressive, life gain is key. Now on top of that, Dark Heart of the Wood, that life gain component also works together really well with Sylvan Library. Sylvan Library, a card from Legends that allows you to draw up to two extra cards a turn, but you've got to pay four life for each card. So if you want to draw three cards, for example, instead of your normal one, you got to pay eight life. Now, usually that's a pretty big ask. But when you've got the Dark Heart of the Wood and you've got a Lantex on board together with that Sylvan, you actually don't mind paying that much more. Now, if we look at the rest of the deck, we see that white control package with, you know, the four Swords to Plowshares. We see the three Disenchants. We also see a little bit of Urnimgeddon in here in the form of one Armageddon. Armageddon and Lantex, a very old school combination, of course. And then we see four Sarah Angels, four Urnims, and also some ramp in this deck in the form of three Elves of Dep uh, Deep Shadow and of course four Birds of Paradise. So again, having those mana dorks in your deck means that you don't have to play out your basic lands. So if you have that one land tax on board, you can just simply cast your spells using your mana dorks and again kind of forcing your opponent to at a certain point start playing out the lands and get your land tax active. I think for both of these decks, obviously having an active land tax on the table really, really helps. So I'm, I'm just really wondering how and what's going to happen after sideboarding. I mean, or maybe these players uh, going to decide to maybe board out their land taxes. I mean, it's a, it's a possibility, you know, because I kind of feel that they're both trying to get their land tax active or is it just going to be a long standstill? I do think that what's, what speaks in favor of Lucas here is the fact that he's got seven mana dorks. So he can actually uh, play out a lot of his cards without the need for any lands. Um, then again, if we think uh, back at the deck of Joe, he's also playing, Joe is also playing with a lot of like cheap casting cost cards. So also he doesn't need a lot of lands. So maybe maybe we just won't see any active land taxes. It's, it's absolutely possible. Um, we also see uh, three uh, winter orbs, by the way, in this deck, which is pretty cool. So winter orb is an artifact for two that says during your uh, uh, untap step, you can only untap one land. So all the other lands remain tapped. And that of course works together really well with the IC manipulator because then that one land that he's gonna untap, you can tap again with your IC and uh, winter orb together with howling mind. There are the only two artifacts in the game that you can deactivate by tapping them. So one of the things that Lucas can do as well is at the end of his turn, or at the end of the turn of his opponent, I should say, in the end step of his opponent, he can choose to tap down his own Winter Orb. That means that all his lands untap as normal, um, but then of course his Winter Orb also untaps again. So the Winter Orb stays active for uh, for Joe, his opponent, but not for himself. So you kind of create a one-sided Winter Orb, which is, which is a pretty cool trick. I think against this deck though, the deck of Joe, the Winter Orb is not gonna do too much because all the things in Joe's deck are just so cheap to cast. He doesn't really mind only if he only has access to one or two mana. It's, it's not a super big deal uh, for Joe. I, can, I mean, I can see that a Winter Orb can wreck other decks, but not the deck of Joe, I think. So maybe maybe Lucas is even gonna board those out after the first game. Anyway, I think it's going to be a super interesting match because of these, you know, they both have the same key card, but they have a different approach to it. And I honestly have no idea who's gonna win this. I mean, on the one hand, I would say Joe is a favorite because his deck is just going so quickly. On the other hand, if Lucas can get his Dark Heart of the Wood online, life gain usually wins it against a direct damage strategy, right? So it's really gonna be who of the two players is going to have his engine running first and that player is probably going to win. It's really a 50-50 
for me. Let me know in the comments below who your favorite is and why. And now let's go to the finals of X points number 20. Game number one, here we go. Lucas sitting on the left, Joe sitting on the right. So Lucas is on the Dark Heart of the Woods Lantex deck and Joe is on the Lantex Lance Edge strategy, white and red. Here we see Lucas, I believe, taking a mulligan. A little bit in the tank here. Got to put one card on the bottom. Let's see who gets to start here in finals number 20. And it is Lucas starting here with a Birds of Paradise. So he now has four cards in hand after that mo. Look at that quick bolt. Bolt the bird. That's a classic. So Joe killing it. And of course, Joe taking a damage from his own City of Brass, dropping to 19. Let's see what Lucas can do. Is he going to play out another Mana Dork? There's a land tax. Okay, that's pretty good. Now the question is, is Joe going to play out a land? I guess the answer is no. <laughs> He's going to play out a land tax as well. Yeah, this was kind of to be uh, expected. Here we see another Birds of Paradise by Lucas. The question now is, can Joe also bolt this Birds of Paradise? Yes, he can. Bolt the bird, number two. So, so far the game is pretty much going as I expected, actually. Lucas trying to drop his mana dorks, and both players don't want to activate each other's land taxes, realizing how important the land tax is for their strategy. But this is a black vice, and this is perfect for Joe, despite the fact that I think Lucas only has now maybe five cards in hand after the draw. Eventually, that vice is going to force Lucas to do something. There we already see that action playing a Sylvan Library, so allowing Joe to have a land tax activation here. I do think it's a good decision from Lucas, also because he can now select his cards with that Sylvan, and he's going to look for more mana dorks, I assume. He doesn't have a Black Source, though, to play out those Elves of Deep Shadow. And here we see Joe picking two Mountains and a Plains. So great news for Joe. I wonder if Joe also has, for example, a Savannah Lions. That would be perfect for him. So putting those cards in hand now as well. And of course, having his normal draw. I mean, Lantex is really sick when you think about it. So here we see a Plains and there is a Savannah Lines. Two Savannah Lines hailing the table here. Problems for Lucas. Of course, both players still pretty high up in their life totals. And now Lucas is going to look at the top three cards because of the Sylvan. He can put them in order and he's going to draw one. For every extra card that he wants to draw, he's got to pay four. And he's going to play a sword on one of the lions. So Joe goes back up to 17. Lucas at the moment on 19. So both players still pretty high up. And there's a pass turned by Lucas. Interesting decision, of course, for Lucas to play at main. He's going to drop to 17. Now, after the attack of the lions, both players on 17. There's a white knight. So a lot of pressure on the board here. And I think if you're Lucas, you want to find a way to get enough mana so you can play out your Sarah Angel or your Urnum, because those creatures are so big, they can stop the Knight and the Lions. But of course, the problem is if Lucas wants to do that, he's got to play out the Lance. He's going to take an extra card here, it seems. I believe so. He's going to drop or not. Going to go through the cards again. I mean, if you're Lucas, what you want to do here is, I guess... Find a Swords would be great, but remember, um, you know, that's only going to solve one of the two problems. And, okay, he's going to play out a land. This is interesting. Going to play out a Regrowth. Okay, Regrowthing the Swords. This is, I mean, it is something. And I think Lucas only drew one card, by the way, because his life total is still on 17. Uh, Joe going back up to, uh, to 18 after that Swords. And again, uh, a land tax activation for Joe. Things are looking really good here for Joe. Lucas having three cards in hand, going to take two more damage, going to drop to 15 probably. I mean, I think if, if, if you're Lucas, you just really want to cast your bigger creatures, but you need your mana dorks to stick or else you're going to keep giving Joe those free land tax activations. There's an attack for two. Lucas going to drop to 15. What is he going to do next? A little glitch on the line here on the side of Joe. I mean, he's got a handful, but remember, it is full of basic lands, mainly. I mean, if he can find even more creature pressure, that would be really good. He still has Ecation Javelineers um, that we haven't seen yet. He's got Mishra's Factories in there as well. So we're just going to have to wait and see. So Joe a little bit in the tank here now, taking his time. 
I wonder if he chooses to play out a land. He can, of course, choose not to and simply collect more land. Remember, his strategy is winning it through Lance Edge. So Lance Edge in Enchant World, uh, where you can discard a land and deal two damage to a target player. So if he can get Joe low enough, then deploy his Lance Edge and simply deal a lot of damage with the lands in hand. Okay, here we see a mountain. Does that mean that we're going to see a Lance Edge already hitting the table? Yes, there's the Lance Edge. Enchant World from Legends. He can now start discarding his hand, so making his uh, lands into mini bolts, two damage per land that he discards to the dome. So that's two damage to the dome of Lucas, dropping to 13. I mean, things are looking bad for Lucas here, dropping to 11. And there's the pass, it seems. Yeah, there's the pass. Okay, untap from Lucas here, looking at the top three again. Just going to pick the one. Makes sense. You don't want to take damage. You're already on 11 with that Lance Edge. Tapping two here. Another Sylvan. That's not great. This is really bad for Lucas. I think Joe has this one, to be honest. There's an attack. Going to drop to nine. No tax activation. Because both players have three lands at the moment. Joe playing another tax. Okay, that doesn't matter much. So it looks like Lucas is going to get some more time here. Is there a bolt? No, there's another vice. Okay, again, not a big problem for Lucas. Only three cards in hand. The biggest problem for Lucas here right now is that one Savannah Lion. If he can find another Swords or, you know, actually an Elves of Deep Shadow would be great. Well, he does, yeah, he has a green mana. So he can play Elves of Deep Shadow, block the Savannah Lion. There's a disenchant. What is he going to dis... Oh, the edge, of course. So he's going to disenchant the edge. Look at that. In response, discarding four. And oh, that's it, actually. He was already low enough. So that's it. He would drop to one. And then, of course, next turn, Joe can attack with the line. He would go down to minus one. So this is a game one victory for Joe. I wonder how these players are going to sideboard. But we'll give them some time to do so. And then we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's Lucas on the play again. And look at that. That's bad, man. He's got to take a mulligan again. Maybe it's just not his day. Starting with six and opening with a land tax. Okay, let's see. Is Joe also going to open with the tax? Nope. He's going to open with the lines, which is actually better because it's going to put some pressure on Lucas's life total from the get-go. If you're Lucas, you want to hope to find a Birds of Paradise here or an Elves of Deep Shadow. That would probably be even better because Elves can block the lines uh, to its death, and also it can generate some extra mana for Lucas. And Lantex here by Joel, by the way, in a pass turn for Lucas. Let's see what Lucas can do. Just passing the turn. Okay, so that means that Joe can attack again, putting Lucas here on 16. I guess if you're Joe, there's not really a need to play out a land, right? You don't want to activate Lucas's deck, so you're just going to pass turn again. And here we see another Lantex by Lucas in just a pass. There's an attack with the Lions. So he's already on 14, another tax by uh, by Joe. I wonder if Lucas is going to be forced to play out a land here to find a solution against that lonely Savannah Lions. Those Savannah Lions have been super annoying for uh, for Lucas, by the way, in this, uh, in this match. Remember, this is game number two. Lucas already behind a game. He has to win this to still stand a chance of becoming the champion here of uh, X points number 20. If you like X-Points, by the way, and you want to join, please check the description below. There you will find a link to their Facebook page. And you can join for free. It's a completely free tournament. Ooh, this is interesting. Lucas finding the strip mine, playing it out, not activating it. And Joe actually not activating his Lantex. I'm a little bit puzzled here. Joe could have had a Lantex activation, if I'm not mistaken, choosing not to, it seems. Is Lucas going to strip his own Savannah here to activate his Lantex? I wonder... That could be an interesting strategy. And Joe, after that attack, putting Lucas on 12. He's now in his second main. Playing out a mountain. There's a disenchant on one of the land taxes. Oh, and I'm not quite sure what happened here. I don't know why the mountain is gone. Maybe I'm missing something. Another disenchant on the other Lantex. 
to my knowledge, that mountain, or was he discarding the mountain? That could be the case. So he was discarding the mountain, then on end step, Lucas played that disenchant on the land tax. That's probably what happened here. Anyway, Joe's still attacking, and we see Lucas now on 10, and Joe also playing out that mountain. And this is quite interesting. Lucas uh, being able to, there's a bolt on the life total of Lucas. Oh, so it looks like Lucas is kind of getting control of the match. The problem here for Lucas is he's on seven. Probably gonna drop and earn him now, or at least I hope so for Lucas. Noah Sylvan instead, he just cannot find any creatures or any other way to deal with that one Savannah line. That Savannah line has done so much work, 10 damage already, plus the three damage of the bolt. That means Lucas is on seven. And this is just such a problem here for Lucas, that one Savannah line. I mean, it's understandable that he's taking his time here, trying to find a solution, trying to find a way out. He's on seven, he's one game down. Is Joe the new winner of X points 20? That is the question. Gonna take care of the mountain, which makes sense. You wanna protect yourself against any more direct damage, but you know, there's probably a pretty big chance that Joe has another mountain. Exactly, there's another one. Tapping two, what are we gonna see here? An Ankh of Mishra, ooh, that is pretty rough. Lucas being on five, and he needs kind of a land to play out and earn him, for example, but that would cost him two life because of the Ankh. And then he would go down to three. This is really bad news here for, for Lucas. Of course, only picking one card doesn't have the luxury to pick more cards. Okay, there's a Swords. That's actually pretty good for him. But Joe is now on 22, which is insane. There's a Bolt. He's gonna go down to two is another Bolt. That's it. Oh, man. I just kind of felt like, like the puzzle pieces you know, weren't there for Lucas or weren't there in the right order for Lucas to really make this into a match. I mean, Joe was just too quick, too dominant, too early in the game. And of course, we have to congratulate Joe here uh, as our new champion, champion of the number 20 X points monthly finals. Well done, Joe. Here we can see your deck, man. It's pretty good. And I guess Lantex is back on the X points map, or maybe it was never really gone at all. Anyway, thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you go, please take a moment to like, comment and share this on your socials. All those things are free and it really helped the channel move forward. And of course, hit that subscribe button if you're not a subscriber yet and don't forget to ring that bell. Okay, now that that is all out of the way, there's one last thing that you can do, and that is you can become a patron of the show. So if you want to help me keep Timmy Talks afloat, please take a moment to check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks and check out the Timmy Talks Patreon page because there you can find out how you can become a patron. It already starts with just $1 a month and you get something really cool back for that $1. Of course, you are supporting me as a content creator, but also you will get access to the Timmy Talks Discord all the Timmy Talks tournaments and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.